My wife, Jenny, and I are keen photographers. Uh, these days, because of the time of our life, we spend most of our time photographing our 13 grandchildren. But we really love getting out into the world of nature and photographing the beauty of what God has given us to see there. Uh, many of our trips, we try to incorporate a little expedition to do photography on our own. Right now, in fact, rather than doing this filming, uh, we'd rather be out photographing this beautiful part of the world. Frustrating, however, to live in the Chicago area when you enjoy nature photography like we do. We're about five hours from a really fun forest. There obviously are no mountains around to photograph. And so we try to focus on the smaller aspects of nature. When we go for walks in our area, we pay attention to the tiny flowers alongside the asphalt we're walking on. And we marvel at the way God has created all of these flowers tiny, sometimes relatively insignificant, and yet beautifully formed for us to enjoy. Remember, of course, how Jesus used those flowers as an example. Consider the wildflowers, he said, and uh, recognize how God himself has clothed and dressed them. Uh, sometimes we talk about the way God has created these flowers and scattered them all over our world, a remote mountain ranges where perhaps no human being has ever been, and yet there those flowers are, beautiful, something God has created uh, for their own beauty and enjoyment. One of the things we want to do in this series of uh, talks about creation is to encourage a celebration and enjoyment of the creation around us. I fear that so many of us are encased in our technological worlds, uh, are so much part of the built atmosphere around us, the built environment, as it were. Uh, we, 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 we live in air-conditioned and heated homes. We get in air-conditioned and heated cars to drive to a heated and air-conditioned office. And we don't really see very much of nature on a regular basis. God has given us this beautiful world to enjoy, to celebrate, and ultimately, of course, to stimulate worship of him, the one who has created it. We want to encourage what we call creation care. But to, to encourage creation care, there has to be deep appreciation for creation itself. And so as we approach this issue of creation care, there are kind of three preliminary questions we need to ask and answer. First, what are we talking about? Second, why are we talking about it? And third, how can we meaningfully talk about it in a good conversation with scripture? So first, the what question. We've talked about creation care, and obviously there's an appeal to that phrase because of the alliteration. It just sounds good rolling off the tongue. And so it's very widespread as a way to, to, to describe what we are talking about. But we do need to pause just a little bit to explain why we're using the phrase and why we think it's a useful one. Let's start with the second word, care. There's a useful double meaning with this word. We care about things, and because we care about them, we care for them. I care about my children. Even though they're grown and living out of our home now, I still deeply care about them, and so I do everything I can to care for them. So it should be with respect to the created world. It is because we care about it, love it, and enjoy it, that we will be dedicated to caring for it. Now, the first word in our phrase, creation, also needs to be explained just a little bit. There are other words we could use here, of course. Very popular in our world is the word nature, for instance. We hear a lot about the world of nature in various ways. Useful word, scripture uses it, so we shouldn't be afraid of using it. But the problem is people tend to invest that word with whatever meaning they want, and so it ceases to be really useful sometimes. For instance, we often hear people talking about mother nature. Kind of an innocent way, perhaps, to talk about the natural world, but it can sort of verge into a sort of a pagan view of nature as a deity or something. And we obviously want to avoid any nuances of that sort. On the other hand, the idea of nature can also uh, fall into kind of a mechanistic way of thinking about it nature as something to be used and exploited for the benefit of humans. And we think, well, humans appropriately use nature for their 
benefit. In many ways, that's a very short-sighted way of thinking about the world around us. Another word we could use for what we're talking about is the word environment. Very, very well known and perhaps the most widespread word used today to talk about generally the subject we are looking at. However, environment also has a, a bit of a negative side. The negative side is that it tends to focus on humans in terms of their enjoyment of their surroundings. We talk, for instance, about, I have a good work environment, or I have a bad work environment, and the focus is on whether I am enjoying that particular world, the setting in which I am working or not. So the word tends to focus uh, a little bit too much on anthropology. Now, as we're going to see in the lectures, uh, there's an appropriate role to think about humans in the world of nature, their environment. But it's not the best word to start with because it does focus too much on us, anthropology, rather than on God, theology. And here is the virtue then of the word creation, of course. By using that word, we are constantly reminding ourselves that the subject we are talking about is not some blind matter of chance. It's not just some mechanism out there. It is rather God's own work of creation. It is something he has made and formed, is guiding, and has a destiny for. And it, it usefully then reminds us as Christians about the fundamental way we need to think about the issue we're talking about in terms of God and his purposes rather simply than our needs or our wishes. So that's the, the what, creation care. Let's turn now to the why. Why should we be talking about it? Uh, I can think of three pretty good reasons for us to be talking about creation care, for us to be spending time doing a video on it, and for you to be spending time watching a video on it. First of all, as most of us will know, the whole issue of the environment has become an important and significant issue in our culture. Uh, we can trace the modern focus on the environment back to certain key books. We think of Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac, published in 1949, in which he talked about the environment of one small place in Wisconsin. Or Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, in 1962, where she drew attention uh, to the uh, problem of pesticides and the issues they were creating for the world we live in. It's worth, by the way, noting that evangelicals were on board with the movement very early on. Uh, one of the great modern Christian apologists, Francis Schaeffer, uh, wrote a book in 1970 entitled Pollution and the Death of Man, in which he tried to bring a Christian perspective to this new issue of the environment. Both Leopold and Carson and many others who have written on the issue of the environment were coming at the issue from a somewhat scientific perspective. And that's one of the things that, of course, has just uh, taken hold of late as well. Uh, environmental science, the study of the environment from a scientific standpoint, uh, has become a very significant matter in colleges, universities, and in many other areas. Scientists looking at the world around us, sometimes with new tools that we've never had before, in order to give us information about the fact that, yes, as we're going to be seeing, the created world around us is in trouble and has challenges. It's changing. And of course, while climate is always changing, the, the, the world is always changing, nature is never static, uh, the question we have to ask is whether these changes are all to the good, uh, whether they are the kinds of changes that, that God would be himself wanting to see happening with his world. Some of us can have personal experience of these changes. Uh, my wife and I visited uh, our son and daughter-in-law and their family in Shanghai, China, uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, they have three of our grandchildren living there. Uh, and we noticed that one of our granddaughters had a persistent cough. Why? Because they were living in a city, Shanghai, which was one of the most polluted cities in the world, where the atmosphere day after day was so filled with pollutants that they would affect the ability of people to breathe, affect children's 
health in very significant and sometimes dramatic ways. Another personal example of seeing the effect of uh, the creation on our world and the way it's changing uh, came with my, my wife's trip, my, my, my wife and I making trips to Alaska. We had the privilege to get there twice now. By the way, I recommend that to anybody. It's a wonderful place to visit. Uh, we were there in 2001 and visited a place called Portage Lake, not too far from Anchorage. Uh, a lake famous for uh, the glaciers that you could see on the shore and the large, massive chunks of ice that would float in the lake as a result of the glacier being there. Uh, beautiful. Took some great photographs there. Uh, fast forward seven years, 2008. We're, we're back to the same place, excited to visit it again. Uh, and to our dismay, the glacier has retreated to the point where you could hardly see it anymore. And in place of these garage-sized chunks of ice in the lake, you find these sort of oversized ice cubes floating around and not very many of them. Climate had changed, glaciers had retreated, the, the creation had changed. For many of us, these changes are just things to observe, to sort of be interested in, maybe mildly concerned about. We have to remember a point we're going to be coming back to is that some of these changes are dramatically affecting human beings all around the world. Uh, their ability to, to live, their ability to grow crops, their ability to find clean water. Uh, all of these things are being affected by some of the changes around us. Uh, and as Christians, I think we need to be interested in addressing those issues and showing the world around us that, uh, yes, we do have resources as Christians to answer some of the questions, to address some of these uh, issues. We want to prove Lynn White and others wrong, that in fact, uh, rightly read, uh, the Bible uh, is a, a book that encourages us to think not only about humans, but about the broader world around us and its health and how we can be good caretakers of that world. The most important reason we study creation care, however, is simply because it's part of God's revelation and scripture to us. And I think an appropriate focus for us these days because it's been an underappreciated part of God's word. Uh, we, we study it because God has put it there and wants us to understand something about his purposes, not only for humans, but for the world he made, for the creation he brought into being. Uh, and so that's the main reason we want to study this. We are responsible as Christians to all of God's word. And we have to make sure that we're listening to all of that word not neglecting any part of it, or we're not the kind of Christians, not the kind of Christ followers that God intends us to be. So that's the why question and my answers to it. Let's turn now finally to the how question. And when I pose the question of how, I'm thinking especially, how do we go about using scripture validly and usefully to address a topic like creation care? The problem is an obvious one, I think. You can't go to any text, particularly in the New Testament scriptures, and find a paragraph that is entitled Creation Care. Uh, you, you don't find clear imperatives, for instance, in the letters of Paul or of Peter or of James or the other apostles, uh, in which they are directly instructing us about the importance of caring for creation. There are many other issues which they address very directly, and of course, that makes a pretty easy transition into our culture. Are we supposed to give money to church and to missionaries? Yes, scripture makes very clear our responsibility to help other believers, uh, to assist the work of God by giving money. So that's a kind of a direct correlation from the Bible to what we experience in our day. But this issue of creation care requires a little bit more thinking, a little bit more effort uh, to, to understand and to appropriate scripture for. Uh, let, let me talk about an important book on this issue written by David Harrell, Cheryl Hunt, and Christopher Southgate. A 2010 book entitled Greening Paul, or you know, How to Make Paul Green. And the question they're addressing is what we sometimes call a question of hermeneutics. How do we validly use scripture to address this kind of issue? 
they suggest three different strategies that are popular. One is what we might call the approach of resisting the text. This is popular with some more radical environmentalists who, who think that the biblical text is irredeemably anthropocentric, that it can't be rescued and, and made a basis for genuine creation care. And so the, the job then is to resist the Bible um, and not allow it to shape our thinking on this issue. Now, this is a, a view that, as the authors of this book make clear, uh, can dispense with the Bible altogether. It's an approach in which we sort of make the Bible mean whatever we want it to mean. And we are concerned to stand under the Bible, not over it. And a resistance approach in that sense, in our view, is not fair to how Christians should read, understand, and, sub and subject themselves to the authority of Scripture. Now, there is a point about this resistance, however, that maybe we do need to resist certain unfortunate cultural tendencies that have detracted from our full understanding of what Scripture is saying. In the Western world, we are heirs to a tradition we sometimes call dualism, uh, a, a view that says, you know, what's really important is the spirit or the soul and, you know, the body and the material world don't matter. Uh, we should just shove them to the side or use them any way we want. Uh, I'm very much convinced that that's a, a very false reading of the Bible, and it has not been fair to all Christian tradition either. But that is a tendency in our culture where perhaps to be fair to Scripture, we need to resist that item. We need to resist the pressure of the culture at that point, just call it for what it is, uh, and, and, and resist it in the name of Scripture itself. Now, a second approach that these authors talk about is a revisionist approach. Here, we, we are looking at the Bible in a new light, and uh, I think there's some appropriateness to that when we combine it with their third strategy, recovery. By, by, by that, we mean that we are trying to recover a genuine message in Scripture that has been lost or has been minimized in an unfortunate way. Uh, and that as we do that, yes, we might revise our understanding of Scripture here or there. I have taught the authority of Scripture to students and to Christians for 45 years now. And the point I always want to make about that issue is that uh, our, our view of Scripture isn't important for its own sake. It's important because of the way we treat Scripture and live Scripture. And if we truly are convinced about the authority of Scripture, then we are going to be willing to change our mind about what Scripture teaches sometimes. That's part of growing in Christ. That's part of the inevitable process of reading God's Bible again and again and again and allowing it to shape our thinking and influence. So as we approach this issue of creation care, our job is to tease out from Scripture a robust biblical theology of what Scripture has to say about the created world, and then we will see how that impacts us, how it should influence our behavior, our thinking about these matters. As we do that, therefore, it's not so much a kind of straight line from Scripture to application. Yes, Scripture has to remain the authority, the basis for everything we're doing and saying. But at the same time, we have to realize that there are going to be influences from our own culture, uh, influences from the world of science that will help us shape our approach to the Bible accurately. Uh, so rather than thinking of uh, the process as a kind of superhighway where you move from the Bible straight to application, I think we need to think about the, the metaphor of a roundabout becoming more popular these days, uh, the traffic circles that are all over Great Britain and are popping up in the U.S. more and more. Into the roundabout moves the fundamental stream, the great traffic directed by the Bible itself. But as we move into the roundabout, other influences come into play, influences from our culture that sometimes are good, sometimes are bad. Uh, influences from what scientists are telling us. 
And we mix those together as we sort of travel around the roundabout until we emerge with a genuinely biblical but well-informed view of the matter. So we want to make scripture authoritative, but we also recognize that legitimately we bring appropriate questions from our modern world to scripture. Let me give a personal example, if I might. Uh, when my wife was pregnant with our first child, uh, a doctor diagnosed her as having had German measles at some point in the pregnancy. And the doctor pretty strongly urged us to have an abortion. Now this was 1974, uh, in the days when Christians really hadn't thought much about the issue of abortion yet. And so we, we were very conflicted about this, but, but finally decided, no, no, it would be wrong to have the abortion. We went ahead with the pregnancy. And the result is Jonathan, uh, our son, who is now participating with me in these videos. I bring that up just to say that once the Roe versus Wade decision here in the U.S. had been made, it forced Christians to, to come back to scripture asking questions that a lot of people had never asked the scripture before. What are we supposed to think about this issue? How should we react to it? Uh, and a lot of really excellent biblical theology came out of that as people search scripture and try to understand what is God's view of, of human life and when does it begin and, and how should Christians therefore negotiate this issue? To some degree, I would suggest a little bit of a parallel with creation care. Uh, that here also, there is an issue that has been brought up in our culture uh, that Christians, I think, need to make decisions about. A lot of the decisions about who we vote for should be affected by this issue, for instance. Uh, how do we validly, as Christians, come to a decision about what God would have us think about this? Well, we, we turn back to scripture with these new questions, doing creative, and appropriately based biblical theology uh, to see what we can conclude about what God would have us think about this issue, how he would have us react and behave. Uh, we want you to be excited about it. We want you to engage with it. Uh, we want you to see uh, the kinds of things uh, in scripture that maybe we've not seen as often as we should uh, to bring a new appreciation, not only to uh, scripture, to God, but to the world that he's created all around us.